All right, well, welcome everybody. I'm Amanda Williams and joining me is Jim Zobel. And today we're gonna to be talking about Bilibid prison um, during the occupation of the Philippines by the Japanese during World War II. And Bilibid prison served as a POW and a civilian internee camp. Um, prior to liberation in February, 1945, thousands of POWs were processed through Bilibid before boarding the infamous hell ships that would take them to forced labor camps throughout the Pacific. The camp is also home uh, later on to hundreds of civilian internees who live in kind of quite deteriorating conditions towards the end of the war. Um, today we're going to be talking about Bilibid, its function, and the conditions in which all of the prisoners lived and the eventual liberation of Bilibid um, in 1945. So before we start though, Jim, I do wanna clear up one thing because when you read about Bilibid, you often come across old Bilibid prison and then new Bilibid prison. And both are used, I think, during the Japanese occupation, but why are there two of them? Where are they located in relation to each other? And did they have different uses? Um, during the occupation? Yeah, um, Old Bilibid prison is in Manila itself. It's about two, 300 yards north of the Pasig River. It sits right in between Rizal and Quezon Avenue, uh, Rizal Avenue and Quezon Boulevard. And it was built in about 1865 by the Spanish. It takes up about six blocks of uh, territory. It's got square walls, but it's one of the old roundhouse type prisons. It's got 11 barracks that uh, project out from the central guardhouse. Uh, being built in 1865, it was used by the Spanish for all their prisoners uh, for everything that they did. Uh, and then it was condemned in about um, 1940 by President Gazon. And they built a new uh, place down a uh, little bit southwest of the city um, by um, Lake Mamatid. And that's uh, near, it's in Montenlupa. And that's what they call New Bilibid Prison. And uh, yeah, it was used, uh, both of them were used during the war. Uh, the, the old Bilibid became like the main um, military hospital of the, uh, for all the American POWs and allied POWs that came through there. And then Montan Lupo was used more for uh, Philippine guerrillas and Philippine prisoners, things like that. Um, as well, uh, they had a military prison uh, on half of uh, Bilibid. Because see, in that Bilibid prison, uh, there was a dividing wall that went down the center through the guardhouse. And on one half, it was uh, Japanese uh, Kempi Tai, you know, the military police um, that control that. And then on the other side is used as the uh, um, prisoner of war camp. Uh, that they'll have. And then there was a back section that will be used by the prisoners of war and then by the civilian internees later. So yeah, at, at Montenlupa, um, New Bilibid Prison, the, the uh, Philippine guerrillas during the war, they actually do a, a raid on that place and free a lot of the um, prisoners that were there. And then after the Los Banos raid in February of 45, when they liberate a lot of those um, civilian attorneys at Los Banos, they're all brought there to new, new Bilibid, but old Bilibid prison is the, the place that all Americans remember as just being the, the hole of death that it, that it was. Okay. Now with the surrender of U.S. forces and Filipino forces in the spring of, uh, 1942, the Japanese suddenly have tons of prisoners of war. And we know about the Bataan Death March, and we know about the movement of POWs to Cabana Tuan and O'Donnell, but where does Bilibid come into all this? You know, who is being sent there and when is that being stood up as a POW site? Well, the with the Death March, you know, everybody was hiked to uh, up to there to San Fernando and they got those uh, railroad cars up to, you know, Capas and O'Donnell. And that's where they all go. And there, you know, there's so many of them and they're all crammed in there. And the Japanese then start getting Cabanatuan ready because they got more than they thought. And that's where all those guys from Batan go is there. Now, Bilibid is, you know, in Manila it, itself. And it's, it's about late May that they open that place up and they're going to start putting prisoners of war there. Uh, after Corregidor surrendered on, on May 6th and all those harbor forts surrendered, 
uh, you had all those personal there. Uh, it's about 7,000, 8,000. And uh, the Japanese kept them there on those islands until about May 24. And then, uh, you know, they brought them into Manila on boats and they dropped them right there where the Manila Yacht Club is today. And then they had the humiliation march. And all these prisoners uh, will march from there to uh, Bilibid. And they go up Dewey Boulevard and they go up Brazil. Uh, you know, these guys are, are all sick already. And so they'll be the first contingent that really goes in there. And they pack about 5,000 or, you know, that's what the, the numbers range. Um, and there's Filipinos in there. There's Americans in there. Um, and they they pretty much uh, put them in there for about five, uh, five days because almost immediately they start taking uh, 1,500 a day uh, to the camp up at Cabanatuan that they've now opened as well. So in those, in those first days, you've got all these people from Corregidor and all the harbor ports. And it's, it's really kind of uh, jarring when you read these reports, like the, the guys on Fort Drum, uh, they, you know, the, you had a small group there because Fort Drum was the concrete battleship. Um, and a lot of the, you know, coast artillery guys are there. And after the surrender, they still had unit cohesion. Whereas on Corregidor, they threw them all in this giant pen at the 92nd Coast Artillery uh, Garage area. And you, you had breakdown of command and everything like that. And, uh, you know, people are starting to already look after themselves. And then you read about these guys from, you know, Fort Drum that were still had good cohesion. And they get dropped off the beach and they're immediately separated from everybody they knew when they get in this march and, you know, everybody all of a sudden realizes, you know, they're all going to be by themselves. Now, the the Japanese are going to use this as a military prison because when Cavite was bombed, there was the Kanyakao uh, military hospital at Cavite. And that was bombed on December 10th. That's where all those Navy guys were. And they had moved out all the patients to Fort Sternberg and in, in, or uh, hospital in, in Manila, uh, just right before the bombings. And when they do that, then they move the Navy doctors up there into Manila. And they're at this Santa Scholastica uh, school there when the Japanese move in the city and they never got moved out. And so they get captured by the Japanese almost immediately. They move down to uh, these schoolhouses at Pasai where they'll set up there, but they've got no medicine. They've got no equipment. They've got no anything. And so when the Corregidor guys get moved into Bilibid the first time, those Navy doctors will go to Bilibid and they'll start setting up there. But like I said, they've got nothing to work with. And it won't be until July uh, when they start moving in all those uh, doctors who were still on Corregidor working with the work parties and they bring all the equipment from Corregidor and a lot of you know drugs and everything that they can start working this and you'll have all these famous names uh, you know LB Sarton will be one of the first commanders of, of Bilibid he's the main doctor the main guy at Kanyakao was this guy George Davis he was a captain but he'll go to like Manchuria with Wayne Wright and all those people mm. Bilibid you'll see all these influx of all these different people over the years because like you said you'll have work parties going out of there you'll have all the movements of you know, all of a sudden they'll have 2,000 people come in for these hell ships that are be going out, you know, and this will be going on throughout. You'll have all these, everybody who's anybody in that whole campaign comes through there uh, and, and everybody will see them. And uh, you'll have all these doctors. Uh, Thomas Hayes wrote a very famous, you know, Bilibid uh, diary and, and he'll just rail on everyone, you know, because it's, it's, it's dog eat dog, you know, almost immediately. Um, you'll have a lot of great people, but it's 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 just a, a horrible thing altogether. You know, at at all these camps, um, the the when when they moved in all those Navy doctors, they also closed down those hospitals on Bataan, Hospital One, Hospital Two, and they brought all the patients there to Bilibid as well. And they put them in that back old structure that was a you know former hospital they had built, but they stripped it all to. Uh, build new bill of prison. So there's no electricity in there. There's no walls or anything like that. Everybody's just laying on the concrete, you know, because there's no, uh, you know, it's it's prison. You've got guards that are staring down at you 24-7. They're all very much full of anger and hatred. You know, it's not going to be till later in the war where you'll find, you know, all these guys that are, you know, just on duty and, and you'll see a lot of difference. But at this point, these were the, you know, the soldiers. 
um, that are that are still controlling. So those those early days, you'll have a ton of people in there immediately, and then they'll all move out within like five days. You'll have this contingency of about 650, and then it just becomes a switch up, and you'll have you know this main hospital contingent that will stay there. You know some people will go out, some people will come in, but uh, it becomes this hospital for for everybody of the 30 camps that are in 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 the Philippines. Okay, so it's a, a pretty kind of, it's just a clearing house. I mean, it's a hospital, but then mostly yeah. a clearing house for people who are not a part of the hospital or in the right. hospital. Right, yeah, okay. and they, they, they say, you know, uh, the, the problem there is, you know, they've got better water facilities, you know, I think for those big uh, 200 by 20 uh, foot uh, things off the spoke wheel, the old uh, these cell blocks, you know, they fit like when they have all these people there, like 600 people in there, and uh, that you've got like one urinal, one uh, uh, basin, and like a couple of showers. But that's better than anywhere. But the problem with Bilibit is is the food. You've got no food there, and you know the disease will be just as you know bad there as as, as anywhere else. With you know everybody's got malaria, everybody's got dengue fever, everybody's got uh dysentery you know because they were all on half rations quarter rations and then when they get captured the japanese really are giving them nothing but you know watery rice gruel and uh it's you know it's 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 rarely you know it'll get better at some points but uh you know it's it's the prisoners you know the japanese in terms of daily life though how do you think it compares to some of the other pow camps in the philippines i mean are there work details? I mean, I guess if it's fairly transient, it's, it's, it's a little different than these other. Yeah. Camps. And, you know, it's, it's, it's different for a lot, you know, all these different places. Um, from the, you know, we have all the memoirs of the prisoners of war. We have all the memoirs of the civilian attorneys, you know, hundreds of them. And that was what they said was that, you know, the, the conditions, you know, at Bilibid were horrible. Then they got the place cleaned up. It got a lot better. But, you know, the deaths didn't stop there every day until about March, April 1943. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, they're not, you know, they, they've got a lot less people. Cabanatuan is, you know, you know, O'Donnell, they were hitting like 400 a day. Um, but the thing is, is that the Japanese are trying to push this co-prosperity sphere idea to the Filipinos. And you lost 20,000 Filipinos. And until they had to let them go. And then they had to start making it that these camps, you know, nobody, not everybody was dying at them. And so they, at, at, o, at O'Donnell, they'll throw Duckworth and, and the Hospital One guys up there and they get that under control with the, with the dysentery and the, you know, the diphtheria problems they're having. And then they'll, they'll put the, you know, the Hospital Number Two up there at, at, at Cabanatuan as well. Um, so, you know, the, the Japanese really have nothing to give them though. And, and really a, a staff that doesn't want to give them anything. And so daily life, uh, you know, there was a guy, Siliphant, uh, William Siliphant, we have his diaries. He was a Navy doctor, one of those Kanyakao guys. But he said that uh, POW, it's a melancholy state. You're in the power of your enemy. You owe your life to his humanity, your daily bread to his compassion. You must obey his orders, await his pleasure, and possess your soul in patience. And the days are very long, and in prison, hours crawl like paralytic centipedes. So it's just an existence of a nightmare. And it's either you, you make it through or you give up. And a lot of these guys who are, you know, of the best of human nature, um, they'll do everything for everyone and, and, and are true heroes. And, you know, you, when you read all these memoirs and then all of a sudden this guy's on a hell ship and they're all, you know, they all get killed. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's, you know, this is one of the, the, you know, worst things that we do, but it is a big part of, you know, the entire MacArthur story, all these, you know, these these prison stories, you know, and uh, everybody will float in and out of all the camps. Um, and, you know, they'll, they'll think different things about, about different camps. But a lot of people will say that Bill had saved their lives. I mean, these doctors are, are maybe, they're doing eye surgery. They're doing, you know, crazy, you know, amount of work to, to keep these people alive. Um, the one guy, Paul Ashton, who, you know, wrote Batan Diary and and somebody gives a damn, he was there for a while, but when he, he was at, at one of the hospitals on Bataan and brought all those sick prisoners there to uh, uh, 
Bill had done those first days. And then he saw this truck come in and just the worst looking POWs he'd ever seen. And they were from that Tayabas road detail where they put about 165 people. And so he's like, take me down there. And out of 165, he said only, he only knew 10 guys that lived. And, you know, he, he was one of them. And because they, they were just in, in the worst, most, you know, polluted conditions, you know, possible. And that's, that's the way all these places were. You know? mm -hmm. You guys are, are gonna, you know, perish in these camps and on these ships. Do we know how many American prisoners of war pass through Bilibid? Well, they 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 say that about twelve thousand went out on the hell ships, and so you can say that, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've read accounts where like. When, when the Marines were put on, they didn't go through Bilibid. They were taken like right to the ship. And, you know, not all of them, but I've read some accounts like that. You know, did they leave that out? But we know that when, uh, when say like the, the Arisan Maru goes, you know, they bring in all 1,800 of those people into Bilibid. You know, so you go from a population of 500 to all of a sudden expanding to, you know, these monster, you know, proportions. And you talk, they, they have these guys that come in and, and you're on your own. You're not told where to go or anything. You just have to find a spot on the concrete. And, and they, they, there's one guy, he said he got there, it was close to dark and he wandered around, couldn't find a spot. And finally he found a door open and went in there. And next morning he woke up and he was looking at the electric chair. He had wandered into the execution chamber, you know, of, of Bilibid prison. Um, and so it, it, it's, it, it, we know that, that uh, you know, when at least 10,000 come through then, we know that at least, you know, five to 7,000 come through in that early Corregidor period, you'll have, um, are all passing. But, you know, out of, out of like 14,000 Americans, you know, they let all the Filipinos go in ju about July of 42 uh, from Bilibid. But from, for Americans, uh, you know, it, it, of the 14,000, about at least 12,000 come through. And you'll have all those high-ranking generals that are captured down on Mindanao. They get brought through. Um, and all that you'll read all these accounts of how, like, they're all mad at those guys because they've all got their orderlies and their baggage and stuff. And these guys have nothing. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's a lot of – there's a lot of people that talk about that guy's never going to make it home alive if I have anything to do with it. You know, because they're seeing the worst of humanity. You know, they see these Japanese, the, the Japanese guards that are the worst, and they'll talk the same thing about that. You know, that guy better hope he's out of the country before I get out of here. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's not anything anybody wants to go through. But yeah, I think, you know, all, every, most everybody will, will see, you know, some of these camps, you know, if not all of them. You know, maybe not the, the work detail camps, but, you know, at least the, the big ones, Cabana Tuan and, and Bilibid. Now, the Japanese hold some important prisoners at Bilibid, I think old Bilibid during the occupation. And one of them is Philippine General Vicente Lim. Right. Um, he's the first Filipino graduate of West Point. He is a, a guerrilla leader. Um, and tell us about him. Well, he had, uh, like you said, he was a commander of the 41st Division in, uh, in the, of the Philippine Army at the, at the beginning of the war in Bataan. Uh, but then when all the people were captured, he, you know, he goes into the camps. When he lets go, he, you know, he, I don't think he, he signs the, the form, you know, of, I won't raise him. But the, the Japanese are always wanting to use him, put him in the constabulary. But he always feigns sickness, you know, I'm too sick to to do anything for you. But then about uh, late 43, he wants to become part of the guerrilla groups. And there's a lot of people in Manila that work with him, Narcisa Manzano, I think, you know, and these, and these guys that are there in Manila. Um, and he tries to make it down to Mindoro where uh, the guerrilla coast watcher Phillips is. And Phillips will get killed by the Japanese. And that's at the same time that, that they capture Lim and they bring him there to Old Bilibid. And he'll be in that military police part of the prison, you know, which is on the other side, you know, as of this divider line that, that comes down. And, and that's where they'll bring a lot of these uh, guerrillas. They use Fort Santiago and old Intramuros as the torture chamber mainly, but they'll put a lot of these, these people in there. And I think Lim goes from there to trial to uh, North Cemetery where he's executed uh, immediately uh, at, you know, uh, 
when he when when he finally loses his life. I don't I don't think they have the court trial there at Bilibid, but you know it's it's a you know these kangaroo courts that that got these people. In uh, December 1944, you get civilian internees from Camp Holmes near Baguio, and they're being sent to Bilibid. Um, is again, are we talking about old Bilibid? Yes. For the, yeah. so, okay, so. Yeah. Why are they being transferred there, and how many of these civilians end up at Bilibid? Well, there's about 500 of them that have been at Camp Holmes in Baguio. The Japanese had captured Baguio in December of 41, you know, just uh, about two weeks after they, they landed, because Baguio is up in the mountains right off the coast where Lingayen Gulf is. And uh, they had been thrown into uh, Camp John Hay first, and then Camp Holmes, this constabulary place and uh, kept there for about two and a half years. They had it better than everywhere. Uh, the, the weather was, was in the mountains a lot better than you know, in the cesspools of Manila. Uh, they had better food, they had gardens. Um, they had a, a really good uh, civilian um, uh, camp commandant from 43 to about 44 before the Japanese military took it over. Um, they have about 22 kids that are born up there um, and they'll, they'll they'll have, I think, like about 100 kids and, and 400 adults. Um, but they get the word on December 27th, 1944, that they're moving out of Camp Holmes and they're going to be moving. Uh, the rumors go through, and they even print in the Camp uh, Holmes uh, daily journal that this guy, Jim Halsema, his dad was the, was the um, mayor of Baguio, the first colonial mayor, and they lived up there and were thrown into camp. And he wrote in the paper there that they were going to Bilibid. So a lot of people knew it. Most, a lot of people thought they were going to a repatriation ship to go home. A lot of people are scared they're going on a ship to Japan. Um, but they moved them out uh, December 28th through the 29th uh, down to uh, Manila. And we know all the Japanese are moving up there. That's where Yamashita is making his headquarters late December is up at Baguio and all Japanese are moving through and that's all they're going to, all these people are loaded into trucks with their, you know, suitcase um, and their belongings and they are trucked down to Manila and all they see is the retreating Japanese army leaving Manila to go into the mountains before the Americans land. And they say it's, it's unbelievable because all they remembered going from Baguio to Manila was, you know, animals everywhere, Filipinos. They don't see any animals. They don't see any Filipinos. It's just all Japanese military moving out of Manila towards the north. And we, you know, were they moved because the operations were moving up there for the Japanese? Were they moved because they were concentrating people in Manila? That's never really been answered. But they send them to old Bilibid and they're dropped, they bring them in uh, right through that Oscaraga on the south entrance and they're taken through the uh, two camps up to that north section uh, where the old structure of the hospital is and they're all put in there and that is walled off from the rest of the, the POWs. There's about 800 American POWs still there now. This is after the Arisan Maru is gone. This is after the Orioko Maru has gone and the, you know, the hell ships have, have ended up. And, uh, and so they're brought in and they're put in that, that building uh, right on the, on the north side there. And, you know, none of them realize at first that this is where all those cases where this is where the communicable disease uh, house was right before they were brought in. Uh, the whole place is infested with bed bugs, you know, uh, rats, everything else. Uh, and all these people have to find a spot on the concrete floor. They had been told to leave their bedrolls back at Camp Holmes. Um, and they get there and, and they're going to have to do the best that, that they can for these last two months before the Americans show up because there's no food there at Bilibid. The Japanese have nothing. Everybody in Manila is starving. The death rates are rising at Santa Tomas, uh, as well as within the city of Manila. And uh, now they're thrown into right in between the Japanese forces that are going to stay in Manila and the Americans that are going to be fast approaching from Lingayen, where they'll land on January 9th. It's a hard daily life at Bilibid for the civilians as well, obviously. I think you, you see photographs sometimes of uh, very young children like toddlers who don't look so bad, but when you look at their parents and even older and, and yeah. teenagers, 
I mean, they just look like, I mean, they don't look good. They look like the POWs, you know, not right. as bad, you know, because a lot right. of these POWs were like 21, 22, and they look like they're 75, you know, because they've, they've had, you know, vitamin deficiencies of everything. They've lost their sight, you know, because of vitamin deficiencies, berry, berry, right. all of it. And uh, these people get there and then the dysentery immediately breaks out among them. They start getting berry, berry from the vitamin deficiency. But like you said, all the parents, they're giving all their food to the kids. And yeah. you know, they're, they're the ones that are, that are sub, but even the kids are, are going to start going hungry in, the, in those last couple of weeks. And, you know, the, it's just lucky that, that the Americans came along um, and they'll find out what it's what it's like to be all crammed up in one place together you know they try to do their best to clean it up uh, they don't really have you know cleaning supplies they'll get the the um latrines you know working again the all these guys that were brought down that you know camp Holmes was was made up of all the missionaries uh that were up north and the miners that had all been gold mining and everything else and these miners come in and you know, there's only two spigots that run. They immediately get three more going because all these guys are engineers. They know exactly what they're doing, especially also there's a, a prisoner in the uh, uh, POW side uh, named Willard Watrous, and he was a doctor. And he had been a big practitioner in Manila before the war, joined the army right when the war started. But they threw him in Bilibid and he made eyeglasses for everybody, Japanese, Americans, Filipinos. And they let him start his business in there again. And he was able, he was one of the few guys that was able to get in food, money, you know, from his contacts. And when the Americans moved in, they were like, hey, can, you know, they were able to signal the guys. Of, and Watrous was able to get them the right kind of pipe fitters and everything they needed to mm. fix all this. And so, you know, uh, ingenuity, you know, some people are able to, to, to work it and help everyone at their best. And so uh, the, the, the prisoners, you know, get it going. And, um, but they're, the, the problem is the food. You know, they have, they have no food. Well, walk us through liberation now. How does that unfold and how many prisoners are freed? Well, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't really look out of the buildings. There were cracks in the walls that you could see things. And on February 3rd, you know, they had been seeing all the planes since September at Bilibid, all the POWs. There was big uh, Japanese arti aircraft artillery place, Osmania Park, right behind. And they said the whole place shook, you know, when these things started going off. You know, they were seeing the bombers get shot down uh, after the civilians get there. So they know the Americans are close. As well, I think the the guys uh, in Bilibid, they they had a, you know a radio they had pieced together in those final late stages, and so they know the Americans are coming close. But then the electricity went out in the city, uh, and so that you know that ended that. Uh, but the the on February third they hear the rumble, you know up north, and when MacArthur's whole deal was you know all those prisoners had been executed at Palawan in December of. 1944, about 150 Americans, uh, the Japanese commander there uh, uh, killed them all. And that came out through the guerrillas because about six of these guys escaped. They made it to the guerrillas. That word gets to MacArthur. And so MacArthur is, you know, and it always said, we're there to go and to rescue our prisoners. You know, even though there's about only 1,800 US POWs left in the Philippines. Um, and so he starts pushing. Once the 1st Cavalry Division lands, uh, in late January, that's when Walter Kruger of Sixth Army says, okay, you know, let's make, you know, we can allow this because you've been waiting for those reinforcements before he really started pushing. And MacArthur goes, tells him immediately go to Manila, go to Santa Tomas, rescue the POWs there. And then he goes to Robert Beetler, who runs the 37th Division. And he knew Beetler because Beetler was in the Rainbow Division with him in World War I. And he's like, look, I want you to be the first in the Manila. But the thing is, the Americans don't know about Bilibid. They knew it had been a prison, but they thought all the POWs had been moved out of there as well. They didn't know that the POWs from Camp Holmes had been moved down there. So when the Americans come into the city on February 3rd, everybody in Bilibid hears it. They hear all the rumbling of the tanks. And through these cracks in the walls, they can see about a block through to Kazon Boulevard, where these American tanks come through and they hit fire at the Far East University, which is right there. And these are the tanks that then go bust through the gates at, at Santa Tomas uh, and rescue all the prisoners there. 
but still they don't know about Bilibid. Now the Japanese guards at Bilibid, when they hear all this, they had gone up on the third floor of that hospital structure, way in the back where all the, the civilian POWs were living, and they moved all them out. And they go up there with Molotov cocktails, you know, but the tanks and everything are too far away for them to hit. On the morning of the 4th, they come down and they leave and they call in oh, Will, or this guy, uh, Wilson, I believe, is the new camp commandant of the POWs. And they call in Eschbach, who's, you know, running the civilians. And they tell him, we're leaving. You know, you're on your own. Don't leave the, the, the camp because there's going to be fighting out there. You all could easily get killed. And they lined up and they left. And all the POWs of the you know, civilian attorneys, they broke out a flag, started singing God Bless America. Somebody strapped it up and they started taking pot shots and all the POWs you know, from the uh, military were yelling at them, take that thing down because they could see it up on that building. But still, you know, no, none of the Americans come there. They can, they can hear the tanks setting up around them. They can hear you know, uh, people moving out all around them. But it's not until the evening of the 4th that uh, the 2nd Battalion of the 148th Infantry of the 37th, they, uh, companies E and F were the first into the city. And they had uh, hit some pillboxes and sent like 3rd platoon of F company around. And the 2nd platoon of this guy, uh, Rayford Anderson, who was uh, uh, one of the, the leading the 2nd platoon group. And they had busted into this old, because that's what Bilibid was, was, a furniture making factory in the late 20th century, all they used all these POWs, and they broke into that, and then they started breaking boards right where Ward 11 was of the military POWs, and that's where all, and then the military POWs were scared, because they thought it was a Japanese, and it wasn't until Anderson threw in a pack of lucky strikes, and was like, hey, you guys, you know, we're Americans, you know, and, and that's when um, the POWs say, you know, that we're all Americans in here, and so uh, Anderson gets word back to his captain, and that's when uh, Second Battalion sends everybody down, and and they'll get there in the in the early morning of, of the fifth. And so uh, really, you know, fourth is is when they come through, and and you know that that early morning, you know, still dark of the fifth is when the the troops start moving in. Everybody, you know, who's asleep, they wake up the next morning to find U.S. soldiers everywhere, um, all throughout, all throughout. Mm, okay. So what happens to all the prisoners after liberation? Well, that night, um, the, the thing is, on the night of the 4th, that's when the Japanese start burning the whole city. You know, that's when they're blowing up everything north of the Pasig River, right next to where Bilibid is. All the fire embers are falling in. And the, ar you know, the army immediately says, we got to move you out. And so they, you know, whereas all these guys who were left in, in Bilibid prison, these military guys, uh, were, you know, stretcher cases. That's why they weren't taken to Japan. You know, as soon as they know they're liberated, that, that clicks something in their brain, you know, to everybody. And so half of these guys will walk, you know, miles to this Ang Tibe shoe factory where the army takes all the military and the civilians. And that's the first time all the civilians see the military guys and just what bad shape they're in. And, and a couple of these guys, you know, they, even though they're free, they, they've given, and they'll die there at the Angti Bay Shoe Factory. Um, and that's when the um, Americans finally are able to feed them. You know, they bring in coffee and donuts first with one of these uh, uh, Salvation Army trucks. And everybody there is freaking out because, you know, all they've been dreaming about forever was coffee and donuts. And then the next morning, it's eggs, it's bacon, it's, you know, everything you could possibly imagine. And, and that's, that's when they know, that's when they know they're free. Now, the, then the shoe factory starts taking fire and they move them all back to Bilibid uh, prison. And so that's where they are on the 6th and the 7th, uh, you know, when, when MacArthur comes through. Okay. Now, we know that General MacArthur visits Santo Tomas. I mean, that's, that's kind of a big deal. Does he visit Bilibid and all of yeah. the prisoners? And, you know, I, I think he goes there first. Okay, so before he even goes to uh, Santa Yeah, you know, I've, I'd always thought that he had gone to Santo Tomas first, but I think he goes there first because, no, you know, they, they see the, sh the prisoners there, the civilian attorneys, they see the shelling of, of Santo Tomas, you know, after MacArthur leaves. Okay. And so I, I, you know, I, I, 
you know, and I might be wrong, you know, but I've been reading all these memoirs and, and, and yeah, the, the seventh he goes there, uh, he sees all the military guys, you know, um, he had already met all the liber liberated guys from Cabanatuan that were talked, brought up to Gimba and, you know, in the north. And he goes there and, and meets with all them, goes through the, the ward of the civilians. Um, uh, Natalie Crowder, uh, who had been released from, you know, she was one of the camp homes. People said MacArthur came up to her and they couldn't speak. They just sat there, you know, tears welling in their eyes as they shook their hands. And, you know, she didn't really care to see MacArthur. But after that, she was like, you know, you know, he really did care. And that's what, you know, um, this uh, other girl, Bessie Krim, uh, MacArthur came to her and he knew her from before. And he actually hooked Bessie Krim up with helping this uh, Filipino girl get, you know, this mestizo Filipino girl get back to the States. You know, so he knows a lot of these people that, you know, and a, a great many of them that are there. Uh, and, you know, immediately says, all of you are going home. You're not staying here. You know, you're not in any shape to resume business or, or anything and less. And so, you know, immediately the, the POWs are taken up north to Lingayan. They'll be flown out. They go all go to, you know, rest camps at, at Leyte, and then they'll be taken by ship out and, and all sent back home in, um, in, in mass, you know, for March, April and whatnot. Now I think about the newsreel footage from 1945 and the liberation and people in America were being shown the horrors of Bilibid prison. They were being shown um, photos and film of uh, kind of emaciated survivors from Bilibid. And I know this, this is speculation, but if the Philippines had been bypassed and ignored until say the end of the war, what are the odds of there having been just a massive humanitarian crisis there? Something that we would be studying today as kind of a, one of the big American mistakes of the war. I mean, do you think that would have happened if there hadn't been the push to liberate the Philippines? Oh yeah. And that was one of one of MacArthur's main aspects of why they had to go back there. You know, the main food was coming from Thailand. Uh, they weren't getting any shipments. Um, they knew that everybody was starving in in Manila already. Um, you know, and through and throughout the Philippines. And if they hadn't gone back, now everybody would criticize MacArthur for you know not going back and killing a million people by starving them all to death. You know, or just, for, it for was, losing. You know, that's the way it would be. For losing, and, the it, and that's what he said. And then not going Go ahead, back. Sorry, and, sorry I, I was just thinking, you know, that he would be criticized for having lost the Philippines, um, but not having come back and saved. Sure. Everyone. And that's what we said, you know, America would lose face forever, you know, in Asia, if, if they didn't go back and, and rescue all these people. You know, now everybody blames them for the Battle of Manila, you know, you know, that's, you know, 80 years looking back and, and most of their arguments are just kind of ridiculous. Um, but, you know, th this is the big thing. And, and that's what all these people know, all these prisoners, you know, that, that, if, if not for him, they, they wouldn't be here. None of them. Any final thoughts on Bilibid? No, we, you know, we, we leave out a lot. You know, I, I, there's so much you'd, you'd like to talk about because there's so many, you know, crazy things, you know, that people saw there and crazy circumstances that happened there. You know, stories of, you know, there was one, and that's just the one I'll leave with. There was one story of this guy that when Bataan surrendered, he got in a rowboat and got in a current and he floated all the way to the China coast, you know, hundreds of miles away. And as soon as he lands on the coast, he gets arrested by the Japanese, you know, and he floats through Bilibid. But nobody has a name for that guy because it was just somebody he met and the guy had this story. Did he make it? You know, did, did, you know, and that's that's the thing about reading all these memoirs, you know, all these people that you're like, wow, that is the coolest guy I've ever heard about, you know, doesn't make it. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you.